All right, good morning. You're going to want to turn in your Bible to Joshua chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 20 of that chapter in this message that I've entitled, Be Careful. The book of Joshua records God giving the land over to the children of Israel. God had given that promise to Abraham hundreds of years earlier. It had been passed down to his son Isaac, to Isaac's son Jacob, to Jacob's son uh, Joseph, and the other 11 brothers. And it had been passed down from generation to generation. And now, after Moses leads the people out of Egypt, and they spent 40 years in the wilderness, now it's time for Joshua to lead them into the promised land and then to conquer that land that the Lord has given to them. And so by the time we get to chapter 9, they had experienced great victories at the cities of Jericho and Ai. It was just a total destruction of Jericho. And then after a brief defeat, they, they took down Ai. The next people in line, however, were not going to just roll over for Joshua and the Israelites. There was basically two groups there. There was a group of kings who all decided that they were going to band together and unite and fight against the Israelites in one accord. And then there was another group who decided that they were going to make peace, that they were not going to fight against them, but they were going to try and make a peace deal with them. So both groups were not going to just roll over for this juggernaut of a war machine that was just bulldozing through the land. Well, let's take a look at that chapter in Joshua chapter 9. Let's take a look at that story beginning in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 9. It reads, and it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan in the hills and in the lowland and in the coasts of the great city toward Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard about it, that they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. It says they gathered together. Why did they gather together? Well, they figured that with, with a larger number, they'd have more strength to fight against the Israelites. But they were uniting their resources together to fight a common enemy. They heard what happened to the other cities and decided that they needed to make a stand together in order to survive. You know, what's interesting is that the enemies of God do this. They will gather together to fight against God's people. They will gather together to fight against the church. But why don't God's own people. Why don't his own people put aside differences and unite together against common enemies of Jesus Christ? Because many times it doesn't happen. Look at verse 3. It says, But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, others planned to make war. The Gibeonites, they reacted by seeking peace over in second corinthians chapter 2 verse 16 the apostle paul says that to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life and who is sufficient for these things someone wrote that the same sun that softens wax hardens clay so one group decided to make war, the other decided to make peace. We often have different reactions, different responses to the same uh, thing that, that we're confronted with. So the Gibeonites planned to cut a deal with Joshua. They wanted to make peace. They wanted to, they wanted to survive, but they wanted to survive not by fighting, but by making peace. But how are they going to do it? Because the, the marching orders to Israel were that they were to take no, uh, no, they would take no mercy on inhabitants, they were to make no covenants with the people, and there was to be no peace. Uh, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, 
in verses 1 through 3, it reads this way. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them into your hand, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their sons, nor take their daughter for your son. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, it makes an interesting distinction. Beginning in verse 10, down to verse 18, it says, when you go near a city to fight it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city all its spoil you shall plunder for yourself, and you shall eat the enemy's plunder which the Lord your God gives you. Thus you shall do to all the cities which are very far from you, which are not of the cities of this nation, but of the cities of these peoples which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. You shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them the Hittite, the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. Did the Gibeonites know about this? Did they hear about this? That Joshua and the Israelites were to completely destroy the, the nations near them, that they were going to take possession of their land, but those nations that are far away, that they could make covenants with them, they could, they could make a peace deal with them, and they could serve them, and they could gain all their plunder. Did the Gibeonites know about that? Well, it sure seems like it, because they did have a clever plan. They put together a very clever plan. In fact, if you look down in, in there in chapter 9, to verses 4 and 5, it says they worked craftily. And they and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on themselves. And all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. They presented themselves as ambassadors with the honor of foreign visits. You know, you realize what that does? to a leader of a nation. When other nations send ambassadors or leaders come and visit their land to visit them and get to know them and, and uh, represent their own country, man, that's, that's a big deal. That sure can stroke the ego of a leader. That sure can provoke the pride of a leader. And this is what they were doing in appealing to Joshua. They were appealing essentially to his pride as ambassadors. And then it also says that they presented themselves as from far away. Basically to show that Israel's reputation had traveled far. That everything that God had done for them, the victories that they had gained, that the news had just traveled so far away. And man, that really went about patronizing Joshua's success. Again, stroking his ego. That they had had such victory that even the people in the lands far away had heard about it. What a plan they had. Look at verse 6. It says, when they, And they went to Joshua 
to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a far country. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. And then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, perhaps you dwell among us. So how can we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? And so they said to him, listen, from a very far country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who was at Asheroth. Therefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us saying, take provisions with you for the journey and go to meet them. And say to them, we are your servants. Now therefore, make a covenant with us. You know, when you look at verses 9 and 10 there, that's one of the most incredible parts of this whole plan. To make peace. This whole plan to deceive Joshua into making peace with them. Because when you look at those two verses, what is missing? Well, what's missing is there's no mention of Jericho. There's no mention of Ai. You see, in that day, the news takes time to travel so far away. So they wouldn't have heard about these victories. They heard about all the... The, uh, the victories that they had in the wilderness. They heard about them uh, coming out of Egypt, but if they were so far away, they wouldn't have heard about Jericho and Ai. And then when you come to the next verses, verses 12 through 15, it's the saddest part of this whole narrative. And you'll see why I say it's the saddest part. It says, this bread of ours we took hot from our provision, from our houses, on the day we departed to come to you. But now, look, it's dry and moldy. And these wineskins, which we filled, were new, and see, they're torn. And these are garments, and our sandals have become old because of the very long journey. And then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. And so Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. It says, but they did not seek or they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Why is that so sad? Joshua and the leaders of Israel didn't consult God about this request for a peace covenant. You see, if they had, they probably would have learned. And why? Well, they were suspicious without seeking the Lord. They said, how do we know? You may be our neighbors. You may be from right around here. They were suspicious without seeking the Lord if they had sought the Lord he probably would have revealed to them. We must stand against the wiles of the devil. We must stand guard against him. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 Be sober be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You see, it's the difference between being in the flesh and being in the spirit. And the Gibeonites, they were clever enough that rather than arguing, 
They just responded to the suspicion by repeating this story and repeating it with detail of how the whole journey went and how they gathered the bread and the clothes they put on and the wineskins, they were brand new. They just repeated the story with more detail. And so the, the deal was struck. Without the counsel of the Lord, Joshua and the leaders, they made a deal with the Gibeonites to leave them alive and to protect them. And then the next verses show that three days later, the truth was made known. Verses 16 and 17. And it happened at the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were their neighbors who dwelt near them. And then the children of Israel journeyed and came to their city on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Cherephrah, Beroth, and kirath -Jerim. It says they heard that they were their enemies. Everybody in the neighborhood was now talking about this thing. They, hey man, look at it. They, we cut this deal with Joshua and the Israelites and we're now protected and we're now safe. We don't have to worry about getting destroyed. This is all good. Let me tell you something. How would Joshua react to this? You know, it had to be a rather nervous moment for the Gibeonites. They had, as far as they were concerned, they had pulled off the plan. They had deceived Joshua and the, and the Israelites. But once Joshua finds out about it, and once Joshua and the Israelites learn the truth, how are they going to respond? Are they going to wipe them all out then? Well, look at verse 18. It says, But the children of Israel did not attack them, because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation complained against the rulers. Then all the rulers said to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. Had sworn to them by the Lord. You see, they made this agreement. They entered into this agreement with them, this peace deal with the Gibeonites, they entered into it before the Lord. They swore to them before the Lord. Well, you know what that means? That means that God's name was now at stake. This whole deal was legal and binding. It came by trickery, and yet they honored it. You know, I remember when I first moved to Miami and began to do business in Latin America. We would go to different countries, to Colombia, Venezuela, Panama, Mexico, into the Caribbean countries, and we would go out to dinner, and over dinner and uh, over cocktails, we would sit there in that restaurant, and we would hash out deals. And then, if there was something that had to be remembered to take back, it would be written down on a cocktail napkin and taken back. You know, to those distributors, to those dealers that we were working with, that had the force of a contract. See, back in, back in the United States, back up in Massachusetts at the headquarters, when we would make deals with distributors and with people, we would go and we'd sit across the table and we'd hash out the, the, uh, the ingredients of the deal and then we'd draw up a draft and it would be sent and there would be either agreement or some changes that need to be made. It would come back and it would keep going back and forth and back and forth until finally it was agreed upon and then it was finalized. 
<clears throat> that's the formal way that I was used to doing business in the United States. But down there in Latin America, they were very informal. And if you came to an agreement like that, it had the binding force of a contract. Why? Because you gave your word. You said, I agree, this is what we can do. And as far as they were concerned, your word meant that that was going to happen. It may have been formalized into a contract, but that's only just a process to, to make it to make it legal, to, uh, to formalize it. But that deal was set. Your word meant something. And here, Joshua, speaking before the Lord and making this agreement with the Gibeonites, it had the force of God's word. God's name was at stake because of this. So it was legal. It was binding. It came by trickery. And yet they honored it. Because they did it before the Lord. So, are there lessons that we can learn from the Gibeonites here? Well, let me suggest a couple. Consider their faith. Now, you know, the falsehood, the deceit, that can't be justified. But boy, I tell you, their faith can be commended. Their neighbors chose to resist. They didn't wait for that destruction that they had seen happen at Jericho and AI and figured it was probably going to happen after they heard of what happened in the wilderness and the power that God brought them out of Egypt by. They didn't want to wait for destruction. So they didn't go along with the other neighbors who chose to resist. The way to avoid judgment is to meet it with repentance. And that's what they were willing to do. They were willing to go and work it out and have peace with Joshua. Even though they had to do it by trickery, even though they had to do it by deceit, they were taking a chance that they were going to be able to get a deal. And they did. And scripture records that the Gibeonites were dragged all over all over that land by the Israelites. So consider their faith, but also consider their submission. They wanted to make a peace deal. They wanted to live in if becoming servants was the only way that they were going to be able to live. They were willing to submit to that. You see, we're called to make peace with God in the rags of our humiliation, in godly sorrow, and in the mortification of ourself, denying ourself and our pride, and realizing that we are bankrupt before God and we have nothing to offer Him. And in that humiliation, in those rags, those old sin torn rags we come to God placing our faith in Jesus Christ rather than be destroyed in God's wrath so we're called to be servants of Jesus Christ and live look at verse 21 it says, and the ruler said to them, let them live and let them be woodcutters and water carriers for all the congregation as the rulers had promised them. So what lessons do we learn from the Gibeonites? Well, we need to consider their faith. That they had faith that they were going to be able to, they were going to be able to live rather than be destroyed. That they could make peace rather than be punished. And that's what we're called to in Jesus Christ. To make peace rather than be punished. To submit.
to him and be forgiven. And then their submission. They were willing to become servants in order to live, in order to enjoy this new life. And we're called to be servants, to be bond servants to Jesus Christ in this new life. So what lessons can we learn from the Israelites? Look at Proverbs, verses 3, 5, and 6. You know the passage. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. You see, in all your ways, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Joshua and the Israelites, when it came to that moment, they didn't ask of the Lord. They didn't look to the Lord. They didn't trust in the Lord at that moment. They leaned on their own understanding and came up with a plan and decided to make peace and didn't seek more information on these guys. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. See, if we put God at the center, at the front of everything that we do, he promises that he will lead us. He promises that he will go with us. He promises that he will be there with us no matter what the experience. In fact, Paul says that we follow in his, in his victory. That means that wherever we go in service to the Lord, he's there ahead of us. He's already there. He's already gone through there. And we're following through his victory, through what he's conquered. So we need to remember the Lord. Verse 14. And what it says, it says, The men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Don't be too busy that you don't consult God as you seek to live this life, this new life in Christ. Don't try to do it based upon your own understanding, based upon your own resources, based upon your own cleverness, your own strength. But look to him. Don't be too busy that you don't consult God. So remember the Lord. And then remember the commitment. Look at verse 15. It says, so Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. Then all the rulers said to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. Listen, don't forget the seriousness of commitments before the Lord. If a covenant gained by lies and deceit might not be broken, what about those that are made in honesty? If that covenant made by Joshua and the Israelites with the Gibeonites that was based in lies and deceit because it was made before the Lord, if that couldn't be broken, if it had to be held, upheld, what about those commitments that we make in all honesty? When we make commitments to do something, to serve the Lord in some way, don't forget it. Remember the commitment. Psalm 15 and verse 4. Well, before we read that, I remember when I was in seminary, my professor of sermon preparation, he said, preach for commitment. Preach for commitment. Preach for commitment in each point of the sermon. Preach for commitment in the application of the sermon and the central idea as a whole. Preach for commitment. And why preach for commitment? Because we have a 
a tendency to follow through on the things that we make a commitment to. That's why we don't like to make commitments. That's why we don't like to say, I'll do this or I'll do that. No, we'd rather say, well, maybe I'll do that or yeah, I'll think about doing that or I'll pray about doing that because that gives us a loophole. It allows us an out so that we don't have to follow through. But when we make that commitment before the Lord, then the Holy Spirit will remind us of that commitment when the time comes and every time that we attempted to not fulfill it or to go forward with it. He will remind us. So we need to remember the commitment. Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. Don't forget the seriousness of covenants, commitments made before the Lord. Psalm 15 Verse 4 says this. It says, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. It's almost like the psalmist was looking back to that event with Joshua and the Gibeonites. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. When we make a commitment and it's going to later on cost us something, the Lord honors those commitments, particularly if it's going to cost us something later on, that we're willing and committed to sacrifice, to follow through, even if it costs or hurts us. So let me ask you, what is your covenant with God through Christ? Well, he saved you from sin's penalty for eternal life. And now you serve him. Your sin brought you to the place where you deserved his punishment and eternity apart from him. His wrath was to come down upon your sin. But he, because of your seeking forgiveness, in your faith, in what Jesus Christ did, dying on the cross, raising from the dead, because you believed and accepted that, he was willing to forgive you and give you a new life, to give you eternal life. And in doing that, he purchased your life by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now you have a new life that doesn't belong to you anymore. It's his life. You're now his servant. You're now his possession. And your call is to serve him. Will you do that? Paul says in Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every one of us. There's not a one of us who has gotten out of it and can say I did not sin. We've all gone that way. Every one of us. And in Romans 6.23, the apostle says, the wages of sin is death. Oh yeah, we have to receive the punishment for sin. Ah, but then it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life by Christ Jesus. Because God loves us. He loves us so much 
It says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And how does he show that life? He sent Jesus Christ to the cross. In Romans 5.8 it says that God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And how do we receive that? Well, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, we shall be saved. For with the mouth confession is made and with the heart we believe unto righteousness. But believing by itself isn't enough. We have to ask. We need to ask for that forgiveness and we need to call on the Lord to receive that forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. Romans 10, 13, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you made that commitment? Is Jesus Christ your personal savior? Well, you know, you can, you can take care of that business. If you've never asked Jesus to forgive you and be your savior, you can do that. Just do business with him right now. You can do business with him. Just say, let him know that you know that you're a sinner and that you deserve his punishment. But you believe that Jesus died for you on the cross and rose from the dead. And that victory over death he can give to you. And then ask him to forgive you. And that's it. You ask him to forgive you in faith, believing what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross and in, in the resurrection. And it says you will be saved. You will have the hope of eternal life. And you will have a new life. You will be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Are you willing to make that commitment? Are you willing to place your life as bankrupt spiritually before God? And ask him. Mourning over your sin. Ask him to forgive you. Hungering after him. And his righteousness. Would you do that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the witness of this event between Joshua and the Israelites and the Gibeonites and just how that all went down and what we can learn from that. But Father, may we be those who acknowledge you in every way that we lean not on our own understanding, but in every way acknowledge you. You promise to make our path straight, to direct our paths. Father, I just pray that each one of us would do business with you, that we might know that new life for eternal life, and that those of us who do know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that we would truly honor you and place you at the front and that we would live as your servants for your kingdom as representatives. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.